Hey everyone, welcome to the Field and Garden Podcast. I'm Jessie from the Gardener's Workshop. Today I'm sharing a recent clubhouse chat where Lisa covers everything about basil. If you're not growing basil to use in your cut flower bouquets, Lisa thinks you definitely should be. Here she talks about how she got started growing basil, why and how to grow it, her favorite variety, and the very important topics of harvesting and post-harvest handling. There were several good audience questions in this one too, so I hope you enjoy. So welcome everybody to the Flower Farmer Show. My name is Lisa Mason Ziegler, and I am joined here with um, crew member Jesse Graven, who is also a flower farmer. And we are here today to, um, I'm going to talk about all things basil, which can be a struggle for some folks, but once you kind of figure out your path with it, it can be really a useful, high value crop. And um, so, but before we really get started with that, I want to say that if you're new here, welcome aboard. Um, you can learn more about the work that the Gardener's Workshop is doing over at thegardenersworkshop.com, where you will just find so much. I mean, all of our resources are over there, the blog, the podcast is over there, as well as our online garden shop, our online courses, both our big schools and our on-demand courses, and just tons of free resources, friends, lots of videos and stuff. So you can check that out. So funny that you had asked me to think about how I got started growing basil. So I've been thinking about that. Um, and to be totally and completely honest, I, as many of the other flowers that I still grow today, I learned and took that as a recommendation from Lynn Bozinski in her book, The Flower Farmer, which, you know, was that original book that so many of us discovered flower farming with. And so she actually, I'm pretty sure I have, don't have the book here that I can look it up, but I'm feeling pretty positive that's where I got the the variety from. And then I did like so many of us do. It's like, oh, wow, this lemon basil is so incredibly awesome. I'm going to look at all these other basils that, you know, they have in the seed catalog. And I can remember I've grown them all, y'all. I've grew lime. Um, I grew all those other varieties that have dreamy names that make it smell better. And I will tell you that here I am 25 years later, just growing the lemon, the cinnamon, purple ruffles, and cardinal. Um, each, uh, many of the other varieties, yes, they smell wonderful, but we have found that for vase life, that Lynn was dead on from the beginning on those specific varieties. Um, just like any other flower we have, some have better vase life qualities than others. And so that's kind of how I began to grow it. And I will tell you that that was really how um, we swept so many customers off their feet um, because there really is nothing like the smell of flowers. And that is the first thing people do when they see your flowers. I mean, if you do farmer's markets, Stop and just watch for five minutes if you have good traffic. What is the first thing people do when they walk up to your flowers is they either bring them up to their nose or they put their face down into the flowers. Um, they're looking for fragrance. And when they smell lemons, I mean, I just haven't met anybody that doesn't love the smell of lemon, right? Um, so we have just been big supporters of growing lemon and growing and if you that blog post um that you can see the image that ann included that's kind of how we grew basil also i mean those are buckets of cut basil that you're looking at in that um blog and it's just one of those crops that we just found that we never ever had leftovers there was never enough um, never did a customer say, oh, no, don't put any more delightfully smelling lemon basil in my bouquet. They would take it all. And in fact, I will tell you that um, on occasion when, you know, we're going to talk about harvesting it and getting it to hold up best. When you harvest it at the wrong time, like, for instance, let's say it was our members only market and it's me and Suzanne, you know, Suzanne took care of the customers. She'd say, hey, we're out of lemon basil. Can't you go out and cut five more stems or 10 more stems? Well, it's like noon 
hotter than blue blitzen and i'd go cut it well within 20 minutes it's wilted right you know what the customers would say to you we don't care we'll take the chance that it'll rehydrate at home so we have just found that miss burns lemon has been a big part of what adds to the customer experience so let's talk about growing it it is definitely super easy to grow um, we started from seed. We started in the small soil blocker. It never, of course, like most of our flowers, doesn't get bumped up to anything. We plant that small soil block out in the garden. Typically, they're planted around four to five weeks old. Um, and sometimes um, I do pinch half 50% of my crop of basil. Sometimes I do that in the tray and sometimes it doesn't get done until it's out in the garden. It just depends on our timing. One thing that creates a hold up in my chain of events is when we pinch in the tray, I like to allow those plants to sit in that tray for at least seven to 10 days and to show me that they've recovered from pinching by seeing little sprouts. So if I pinch today, but I have help tomorrow and the weather is good tomorrow, but it's not going to be good next week, pinching kind of screwed that up is what I mean. So oftentimes we'll just pinch them after they get to the garden for that reason. We would plant and allow them to recover from being planted, give them a few days to get established, and then we would pinch. My method of pinching always, um, and I just did a great video of this the other day that I haven't posted yet, is I typically, when I pinch, I pinch 50% of my crop. And that's because I want both the benefits of both ways. When you don't pinch, you get the earliest bloom or the earliest stem that's ready to be harvested, right? Because when you pinch, you're delaying all of that. But when you pinch, you're encouraging branching even earlier and you get more stems. So I pinch half of the bed. Like if I have a bed of four rows, um, I pinch the left two um, rows or the right two rows. So it is, there is a definite difference. I pinched half of my comp Cosmos. We're growing all 14 varieties. And I went down and mowed down, not mowed. I had a pair of clippers two rows on the right and the other, the left side is already starting to bloom, but the right side isn't. It's the same thing that happens with basil. So I, all of our customer bases loved lemon basil. Our florist, our supermarkets, our members only markets, our farmers markets, um, every market that we, in our subscription bouquets, all of them really loved lemon over any other kind. I mean, we do, I do grow cinnamon in the fall. So Miss Burns has kind of taken over our lion's share of the basil crops being grown. So the things that you need to remember, I mean, I actually, because when we sold to florists and to supermarkets, um, they got an invoice with every order from us. Um, it says right on the invoice in big, bold letters right next to the basil, do not put this into the cooler. Um, and that would include our mixed bouquets that the supermarkets were buying from us because that typically happens. And especially if it was a big, busy shop or supermarket um, chain, you know, we sold to multiple chains, multiple stores in a chain because it doesn't matter whether it's on the invoice. If somebody mistakenly puts your bouquets or your basil into the cooler and it turns black as it does, they're not going to think it's their fault. Can I mean, you can tell them till the cows come home, but it still looks like your, your product was not good. So you need to go to extreme lengths if you want to sell them that to make sure that everybody, you know, do everything you can in your power to prevent them from messing that up, right? That is a big part of it. Of course, that's not really the challenge with like your bouquet subscription people um, and our members only market. Um, that's where I probably learned the most about our flowers was in our members only market. And that's because we're in an air-conditioned building, so people tend to hang out longer and chit-chat, and you learn what they really love and what they really don't love and why they love it and what they want more of and what you don't have. I mean, it is a real marketing research.
type of um, environment. And again, I will tell you that, you know, at the beginning of the season, you know, while the basil is still maybe a little shorter than I want it to be, maybe not as mature, we learned that just those first cuts, so each customer gets one little sprig, they loved it. And that's what really drove me to become a really good basil grower. So the challenge with basil, if you're going to farmer's markets, is definitely the heat, um, and which brings me to the harvesting stage. So, you know, when you pinch half of your crop, what you're going to immediately learn is that you get two to three to four times the number of stems than you would have gotten first flush with the non-pinched. So what I see people doing is they overplant the amount of basil that they need. So they're not cutting all that are properly ready on time, which means that next week you're going to be cutting older basil. And the week after that, it's getting older and older. And it starts this really vicious cycle um, because I have found when it gets really woody stems, it doesn't tend to hydrate as well. So let me tell you what I have learned to do. We plant so much less basil at each succession now so that I'm out there stripping the bed instead of leaving more than I want to. Um, and what I have found is we just overall get better quality basil. So even with our big mar members only market, I still only plant five to 10 feet of Miss Burns at each succession. Now keep in mind, we're planting a new succession every three to four weeks. So, but you will run into more problems because people tend to cut basil at the wrong time. Um, I love to cut it just as it's starting to head up. The image that is in the blog that Jesse has posted here really shows the optimal stage to cut in. The blooms, I think I see one bloom, one spike that actually has flowers open on it. And that is really the optimal. Once that flower elongates and is bloomed out um, and the wood, the stem starts to get woody, I just, we just tend to find that we have more hydrating problems. We definitely net basil. Um, our Miss Burns lemon gets over 30 inches tall. It's really quite robust and it'll go down in a heartbeat. And crooked basil is useless for anything but cooking. And you can eat this. I mean, this is culinary basil, but we treat it with conditioners. So we don't recommend people eat it after that. But people tend to not harvest it at the right time and then they don't strip it. So when I have a stem that is stripped properly, usually that means at the tip of the central stem, um, there is usually two branches that are usually located within the top three to five inches from the tip of the stem. Everything below that is stripped off because here's the reality. The only part of that stem that's really going to contribute to the visual of the bouquet is the top few inches. When you leave all that extra vegetation on there, it just sucks the life out of the stem. Basil is the first crop that I cut in summer. We start harvesting at 6 a.m. and I go, I get my buckets while everybody else is figuring out what's going on in life. I grab my buckets and go straight to the basil. Strip it, properly. If you're one of my students, there's videos of me stripping it in your course and stripping all of that off, dropping it in the bucket. And then as soon as a bucket is full, especially if the sun is out and it's a humid, hot, humid day, as we tend to get here in Virginia, I literally will just walk the buckets inside the air conditioned shop if I need to, but, and then go on to the next bucket. But I have learned to be quick and efficient to get them cut early before they get any exhaustion, get them into the bucket and inside in the air conditioning. Um, and so because every bucket on our farm gets a CVBN tablet, that's the chlorine tablet, they deplete, I guess, what's in the stem. And the longer you wait, the less good stuff there is. Nutrition and 
by cutting later in the day, there's really not a whole lot you can do to fix that. However, if I have find that I'm cutting at eight or nine o'clock, I will put a splash, which I would guess is about two tablespoons of hydrator into that water, um, which we use quick dip. And that seems to really, really help it. And you can also just use quick dip as it's intended to be used straight, just pour it in a little shallow dish and dip the stems for about 15 seconds. Um, and that will also resurrect them. So those are the tips that I kind of follow. Jesse, do we have any questions? Um, this one says, my basil is growing in soil blocks and germinated at 100% but now the leaves are starting to have black or brown parts on them. Is there a thing such as overwatering soil blocks? If I'm doing it once a day, I am pouring water off after a few minutes. So the number one question I would have is how old are those seedlings? And I say that because we just experienced this, not necessarily on basil, but on some sunflower transplants um, that we started in the two inch block for a home garden demo. They were just, they were like several days, almost a week later than I normally plant them. And they started getting spots because they're stressed. So that would be my number one question is if they're, you know, over four weeks old, then they just need to get planted. But definitely over watering can cause all kinds of disease problems. Um, so, but when you water in the morning, it's not so much that you're not leaving them sitting in water, is what is the state of the soil block with, before you water? Did it dry out? You don't want the blocks to be moist 24 seven. They should be going through the wet this morning, all the way through to tomorrow morning being dry. And that would really help. But it sounds to me like they might just want to be planted. I've got another one that says, can you replant basil in the same spot later in the season? So we always recommend rotation when you can. I mean, that kind of happens on our farm by a natural evolution of the way that I tend to plant in blocks of beds. You know, there are diseases, there are pest issues. You know, I would only do that if I absolutely had no other choice and I did not have any previous disease or pest issues in that spot with that, with that plant. But again, I just wanna emphasize again, I said that we only plant five to 10 feet at a time. Um, you know, if you're a small grower doing, you know, 20 to 30 bouquets a week, 10 feet, is probably more basil than you need um, when you're really cutting it hard and pinching half of it. So you might be able to use a smaller spot as I just wanna remind people you don't need a lot of spot, a lot of space. Hi, Becky, do you have a question? Hi, thank you. I am new to basil. I have it uh, growing in my trays really well. I'm ready to plant it. I'm in Michigan and I'm worried about rabbits though, rabbits and gophers. Do you have any uh, trouble like that in the South with produce? <laughs> row cover as a barrier, you know, you plant and immediately cover and that tends to like, they don't even realize it's under there. Um, we would definitely probably use hoops if you're using it for varmint protection. So they don't really don't get a glimmer of what is in there. And the other thing that I didn't mention about basil, and I think of just because you said Michigan, um, basil is a real warm season lover. Um, basil, unlike most warm season annuals, um, basil will really sustain damage under 50 degrees, meaning you'll see um, really damaged foliage. Um, so you want to really be sure that you're planting it into the warmer, the better, at least 60 degrees or higher at night. I hope that helps you, Becky. But row covers, we have amazing results with for deer. Um, but the secret is you have to plant and immediately cover. So they just don't even realize it's under there. Yes, thank you. That's helpful. So I had a question about growing basil in soil blocks. Someone asked if it was okay to pinch the basil while it's still in the soil blocks. Great question. Yes, um, we were forced into learning about this many years ago as it was a year of 40 days and 40 nights of rain. And we literally had, oh my goodness, thousands and thousands and thousands of seedlings that were just getting 
older and uglier right in front of my face, but we literally could not plant. There was so much rain. So that's when I gave everybody in the tray a haircut. I just took scissors and pinched everything, literally down to the bottom two leaves. And that bought us I mean, it was such a great lesson. I mean, sometimes things that you think is your worst nightmare turned out to be the best thing you ever learned, right? So we learned then that by pinching in the tray, it instantly opens up air, water, light, air space, the whole nine yards. Um, but again, we would not plant immediately following that. We allow them to then continue to stay in the tray until they've recovered and sent up those little sprouts that you'll see right below where you made that cut. Um, and when you pinch, that just really makes the plant get busy on the roots also. So you'll see a robust root system um, when you do ultimately go to plant. So I had another question about uh, starting basil. Someone had asked if it was too late to start basil this season in there in zone 5B. Oh my goodness, no. We succession plant basil. Um, basil is like a 60 day crop, something like that. So you can, that means that you can succession plant it. Succession planting means to plant it multiple times in a season. So you could plant it up to about 70 to 80 days before your first expected fall frost. So that means for us, we continue to plant basil up until, you know, mid-September or so. Um, and that way you just have great foliages for the fall, as well as, you know, as we get to the end of summer, that's when I start growing um, the cinnamon and the purple ruffles. Purple ruffles is the dark color, which is really a pretty color, but it's really just too dark this time of the year. Um, and so that way, when you introduce it in late summer, primarily early fall, they really feel like you have something new and fresh and um, it works really, really well. And, you know, I also just want to say to people, you know, if you follow the pattern of don't plant too much so you can cut it clean, um, really harvest all that you can each week. And I mean, again, friends, you're better off to cut it, cut every stem that's ready. And if you don't have a use for it, then compost it leaving it out in the garden with this crop more so than any others we just find more issues with and don't be afraid to say all right that succession is done the, the one i planted you know month two months ago is ready now and then let that one go i mean that's the whole point of successioning sometimes because what i find with basil even with providing everything it needs water food great conditions the subsequent, um, I mean, I have cut from the same lemon basil crop for many months. You know, we have about six months of warm here. Um, but I will tell you that with each regrowth, they get a little shorter and a little woodier a little sooner. Um, so there's just really a great benefit to having those succession crops and being a strong commercial farmer and saying, all right, I'm done with that one. Rip it out, you know because you have more waiting over here, because overall that will benefit your customers and you so much more. Anyway, one last thing I wanted to mention is uh, in, in case anyone is not familiar with our uh, private Facebook group that we have that supports this chat, um, we have created a private Facebook group called The Flower Farmer Show. Uh, if you're a flower farmer or aspiring to become a flower farmer, um, you can go over on Facebook and request to join that group. It's a huge group, but it's got great um, activity, lots of involvement and, and questions being answered. And, and uh, it's a great place to, to ask whatever questions, additional questions you might have. And occasionally we pull topics to discuss from that group as well. So hope to see you over there. Hey, Jess, you know what I wanted to mention? I don't know if you actually listened to the podcast, the podcast that I just did with Dave Dowling and Tim Pierce, do you know who I'm talking, which yes. one I'm talking about? You know what right. I learned, what I learned from Tim, he and his wife, um, I was trying to figure out their business model, you know, and at the end of our conversation, he was sharing that he and his wife have kind of taken over this collective 
co-op wholesale business out where they are. And guess how they connected with these people that are now a biggest part of their business is through our other private Facebook group, the florist farmer connection. He mm -hmm. said, he said that he just, po I mean, so any farmer is welcome to join that group also, because this is a place he said that when maybe he's in Minnesota, he's in Wisconsin. That's where he's somewhere cold is all I can remember. Um, <laughs> it is, he it said, is, you're right. It's Wisconsin. Is yeah. it Wisconsin? He said that yep. when he joined that group, he just went in and posted, Hey, I'm Tim and you know, him and his wife. Um, we are in Wisconsin. Any florists out there need flowers? And that's how he connected with who became his biggest business customer. And so I would just encourage that the florist farmer group, am I right, Jesse, is where people meet, the two different groups of people meet and interact. It's like florist dash farmer connection is what it's called. Yes. And, um, and that one is a business networking page, basically. And uh, it was so great to hear Tim talk about the success he had in connecting uh, with Floris over there. I, I was so happy to hear that because that's yeah. really what, yeah, that's really what what we were hoping for with creating that Facebook group is that people would be able to do their own connections and and you know uh, make real world um, business partners off of it. So that was great to hear. It was, it was really, really true. And anyway, so it's just always when we hear those encouraging um, things and we love to get notes from people, y'all, hey, if we've helped you, um, we just love hearing those affirmations um, and we love rallying around you when you have them, so. Thanks. Thanks everyone for being here today. And, um, you know, uh, we hope that you will join us again next time. Thank you so much for Lisa for talking to us about basil today. All right, everybody have a great, week. Okay, welcome back. I have included several links in the show notes on this one uh, to the blog post about basil, to the items mentioned from our online shop, and to our Facebook groups in case you want to request to join those. There's also a link to Lisa's club on the Clubhouse app. We're over there live on Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern if you ever want to come join us sometime. If you like what you're hearing here on the Field and Garden podcast, We'd love it if you'd tell a friend about us and leave a review for us wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Jesse from the Gardener's Workshop, and I hope you have a great day. 